how do they do it? There they are, strolling a Parisian street, relaxing in a bikini on a Riviera beach, or up on the screen in a French film. They are the slender French women. Here to solve the mystery is internationally best-selling author Mireille Giuliano. Her title states the case, French women don't get fat. Her book explains why. An accomplished international businesswoman, as well as writer, she tells Canapé about the French way to health. Well, to sum up the book in a few sentences is, uh, is easy, actually, because first of all, it's a book that is all about pleasures. And it's, about, it's a lifestyle book. But it's also part uh, memoir, part cookbook, part uh, cultural critique with anecdotes. It has um, wonderful recipes and stories linked together. And ultimately, it is the ultimate non-diet book because it's all about uh, a practical philosophy to living uh, bien dans sa peau, well into your skin, that Americans and a lot of women all over the world uh, have to learn. You know, it's, it's your body and your mind connection, but it's based really on the French way of eating. What I've observed over the last 20 years, going back and forth, you know, living between New York and Paris, uh, my, um, my New York friends uh, never cook for me, never invite me to their home. We go to a restaurant and they have this amazing obsession with food, really a bad relationship with food. They feel guilty, food is the enemy. And then when I go to France every six weeks, you know, my friends in Paris and they're as busy as my friends in New York, you know, they all work, they all have families, they travel and, and they always, you know, cook a meal and it doesn't have to be complicated. And uh, the first, you know, difference I notice is the, um, for us, cooking is not a chore. It's an, an act of love. It's sensual. It's fun. You do something for someone you love, and you take pleasure in doing it. And the second thing I observe is that, of course, we take time to eat because we eat for pleasure. And that means, you know, eating uh, with all your senses. When you eat slowly, your taste buds get satisfied with a few bites and we uh, eat around the table. We don't eat, you know, in front of the TV or standing up or on the street or... Because when you eat that fast, uh, it's not called eating, you know, because you eat like on autopilot. You can eat whatever you want. I mean, I have chocolate, I have wine, I have bread, you know, almost every day of my life. And I... guilt? Why should I feel guilty? These are things that are good for you. As long as you don't eat them, you know, in quantity. And then, of course, I have some really special little tricks about French women, like the water, the yogurt, the leeks, a walking, you know, and, and that works, of course. Today, I think we've made huge progress in, in America. You know, there are something like 3,500 markets, food markets in America, and New York has quite a few. Uh, I couldn't live without the Union Square Market. And granted, I prefer it from, you know, May to September. The winter is a little bit, I wouldn't say more boring, but different. You have to adapt. But the point is that, you know, now, sorry, it's no longer the time to eat strawberries and raspberries uh, because they taste, or tomatoes, because they taste less. They're out of season. But now you go to the market and you have apples, you have pears, and it's the same about, about vegetable, you know. Right now you go more into making soups and stews because you have to play with winter vegetables, you know, root vegetable, rutabaga and parsnip and, and turnips. And, uh, and they're not less exciting, they're just different. All women all over the world, you know, especially in the developed countries, uh, we all have too much work, too much multitasking, not enough time for ourselves. Young women don't cook or don't know how to cook, or are intimidated by cooking. If we're going to lose all the connection with food, you know, where are we going to go? Bria Savarin will say, we are what we eat. That's, you know, think about it. We are what we eat. What we put into our body is very important. And so you can't blame, in a way, the diets, the food industry, because they, it's not going to help you. You have to be in charge. And so you have to start reading labels, you have to start, and, and I know that, you know, of course, even in France, women don't have the time to go to the market every day, don't have the time to cook three meals a day. But even if you start, you know, doing it on the weekend and maybe twice a week, 
your family will already see the big difference. When the French New Wave hit high tide in the 1960s, Eric Romer was already in his 40s. Now in his mid-80s and still very much active, he can still claim to be sailing to the horizon of narrative cinema. His latest feature film, Triple Agent, takes a look at the murky politics and espionage that shaped the 1930s in France. Lead actor Serge Franco talks with Canapé about the film and the youthful director. Eric Romer gives me a call and asks me, uh, Serge, it's Eric Romer, uh, can you speak Russian? And I said, depends. If it's uh, for, uh, I, I, I ask it's for a feature film, he say yes. I did, but all the plot is in Russian, because if all, all the, 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 the film is in Russian, I can do that, because, I, well, I can. But if it's just a few scenes, I can. I can learn and speak Russian. And he said, it's okay, come, come to my office. And I go to his office and uh, he, he tried to explain me that it will be the story of a couple. Uh, he is a general, uh, a Russian general, and my wife is a Greek painter. And uh, it's during the Front Populaire, and I am, I am a spy, in fact. And my wife knows that I am a spy, but she didn't know exactly what my activities are. We are married since 12 years, and suddenly she discovers that she lives with a stranger. Je vais partir en Belgique quelques jours. Comme en novembre? Oui, à Bruxelles. Et ensuite? Ensuite, je rentre. En passant par Berlin? Quoi? Qui t'a dit ça? Maggie l'autre jour. Quel commerce là? Mais comment c'est-elle? Son mari n'était pas au courant. Il n'y a que Dabrinsky et moi. Et dit que c'est son beau-frère qui t'a vu. Je sais, il habite Berlin. Il aurait pu venir me saluer. Il n'a pas voulu te déranger. Tu parlais avec quelqu'un et après tu es entré dans un ministère. Quel ministère Elle ne sait pas. Oh là là. Et c'est tout Tu n'as pas l'air content. Mais il y a de quoi C'était une mission tout à fait confidentielle. Donc tu ne peux pas parler à ta petite femme. Et encore moins aux autres. Pourtant les autres le savent. Pas ceux qui ne le devraient pas, j'espère. Bon. Je vais téléphoner à Boris pour lui conseiller de dire à sa femme de la boucler, s'il n'est pas trop tard. Oh, it's terrible, in fact. In fact, it's terrible. <laughs> Because they are really uh, and deeply in love. She's a beautiful woman. She's a little bit ill or sick, how you say it? Sick. Uh, Fyodor, the, the character I, I play, is very... Uh, try to, to take care of her really deeply. He's in love with her, but... You have to, to, to say, okay, it's, it's not, please, Arsinoe, it's not your problem, so please <laughs> do your paintings and don't ask me questions. And very often in the film I say, I don't tell you? I never tell you that? Let me explain. And all the time, we never know if my character say the truth or uh, change the truth or lies. We never know. We never, never know. Méfie-toi, il pourrait vous espionner. Espionner quoi Non, mais au contraire, c'est toi qui me rends service. Mais votre mari ne vous a rien dit Je ne te l'ai pas dit Possible. Qui auriez-vous dû rencontrer je ne te l'ai pas dit. Tu prétendais tout à l'heure que tu disais toujours la vérité. C'était une blague. Oui, Fyodor Alexandrovitch. Un bruit court qu'il serait sympathisant communiste. Je gêne beaucoup de gens, j'ai pris des risques. There is two possibilities, in fact. And it's open. Uh, the audience makes the make choice. Uh, first possibility is extremely clever. And he knows exactly what he do. He knows. He knows. He knows. <laughs> Uh, second possibility, this guy is mythomaniac and is totally crazy. Make your choice. <laughs> Toi, tu as l'air bien renseigné. Je m'intéresse aussi à la politique, tu le sais bien. Dans ce cas, vive Staline. 
Rien ne prouve que l'URSS... Ne nous disputons pas là-dessus. Et vous, mon général, qu'en pensez-vous En passant par Berlin. Quoi Qui t'a dit ça La révolution mondiale est pour le moment... Euh... Euh... Tu ne me crois toujours pas, mais laisse-moi t'expliquer, enfin. Parfois, il est plus habile de dire la vérité que de mentir. Car alors, on ne vous croit pas Tu ne me crois pas France, Great Britain, and the United States have much in common. One shared trait is a great institutional tradition of collecting and displaying art. An exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum illustrates the point. The British Museum has sent on loan selections from its world-class collection of French drawing. Clouet to Sora offers masterpieces from the Renaissance to post-impressionism that include Jean Clouet, Claude Lorrain, Antoine Watteau, Edgar Degas, and Georges Sora, among others. Curator Perrin Stein gives Canapé an overview. Clouet to Seurat is a survey of French draftsmanship drawn completely from the collection of the British Museum. It includes highlights and rarely shown works from their collection. It's a very important collection in that it was one of the earliest public art museums. It was founded in 1753 and it benefited from the long tradition of collecting and connoisseurship in Britain at the time. Collections formed by gentlemen collectors who traveled to Italy on the Grand Tour and bought drawings, and also by a number of artists in the 18th century who collected drawings. The first gallery shows works of the French Renaissance, produced primarily for the, for the French crown, proceeds into the Baroque period. There's a gallery devoted to French Rococo art up to the French Revolution, and the last few galleries show neoclassicism and romanticism, and then in the final gallery, impressionism and works of post-impressionism. Drawings were made for a whole range of purposes, of course, as studies, primarily for paintings, but also for prints, for tapestries, for sculpture, for a whole range of types of objects. But you also see in the show drawings made as independent works of art. This begins as early as the 16th century with all the portrait drawings commissioned by Catherine de Medici of her family. So I think one of the earliest in the show that was intended as a work of art into, unto itself and not as a study for a painting is the portrait drawing of of Charles IX as a boy. Catherine de Medici, who was regent of France in the, in the 16th century, became obsessed with collecting portrait drawings. She wanted to have drawings of all the members of her family, the extended royal family throughout Europe. And she commissioned Francois Clouet and others in his circle to create these very finished drawings. He mixed two colors of chalk, and he would depict not just the face, which is what you do if you're preparing an oil painting, but he would show the, all the details of the costume, even the hands of the boy. And she made a special room to, for her collection of drawings and had them in special boxes. And so she was one of the first, really, to value drawings as independent works of art. I think my favorite work of art would have to be the pastel study of the head of Hebe by Francois Lemoine. This is made for what was the most important large illusionistic ceiling decorated in 18th century France. It had over 140 figures. And for the most important of them, Lemoine made studies in, not just in black chalk, but worked up in pastel to show the palette he planned for the painting. You can see looking at her head that you see underneath her chin, she's shown as if you see her standing on the ground looking up at a ceiling. And Lemoine has used the pastel in the face to show, with pinks and whites, to show her really porcelain-like complexion and in a really virtuoso handling of pastel to show this cascade of flowers spiraling around her head and down behind her neck and across her chest and you just don't get much more Rococo than that. Different artists favor different media. Some might prefer only red chalk, others work in wash, and, and over time they incorporate more color as there's more a sense of wanting to make drawings for display and to compete on the walls with paintings. And this evolves in the 19th century. Um, there are commercially prepared papers, and you see works like in the final room, a Degas using brilliant emerald green paper. This is available commercially beginning in the 19th century when there's a great increase in the number of in the materials available to artists. We conclude the show with two major drawings by Seurat. They're both studies for his famous painting, A Sunday on La Grande Jatte. And they show that Seurat, at the very end of the 19th century, is really looking back to techniques of preparation used by old masters. He prepares this important painting with over 50 studies 
about 28 drawings and about the same number of oil sketches. And he's thinking much like Poussin did in the 17th century. He's perfecting the placement of forms almost as if this was a big complicated puzzle. And the number of drawings attest to the care with which he, per he prepared the, the painting. In the largest drawing at the end of the show, it shows the entire landscape of the painting, but without a single human inhabitant, as if it's a stage set. And he's thinking through the space, the recession of space, before he places any figures in it. And he, has, he only includes the single dog sniffing the grass in the foreground that you see in the finished painting. Ken Van Sickle arrived in Paris in 1955 on the GI Bill after service in Korea. He had missed the era of Hemingway, Baker, and Stravinsky, but found his own space in the infinitely photographic City of Light. Returning to the USA, he developed a rich international career as a cinematographer as well as photographer. The 50 years since his Parisian sojourn are on display in an exhibit Paris, 1955, New York, 2005, at the Photographic Gallery in New York. Canapé listens to what he says about looking. This new exhibition I'm having, or, or this one-man show, is made up of two um, phases of my photography. When I began and, and actually didn't even know I was a photographer in Paris in 1955-56, and then in, recently, this year in New York City, I've been walking around and shooting in a new, completely new style. I was in the army in Korea in 1954, basically I got out, and uh, so I got the GI Bill. And I had always read about Paris and I'd always wanted to be in where Hemingway was and Kiki Montparnasse and all the painters and the artists and, and really go and live the bohemian life. And I had studied uh, at the Art Students League, I had studied painting with uh, George Gross among others. And uh, as soon as I got the opportunity because of the GI Bill, I went to Paris. Uh, I studied uh, French and I was studying painting with uh, André Lotte, uh, who is a Cubist uh, painter. And he happened to have been, which I didn't know at the time, he was the teacher also of Cartier-Bresson and André Cartes. And then I was in the park one day sketching with a friend, still studying, having painting as my major idea. And he said, you know, your, your drawings aren't very good, but your photography is very, very good. So actually at that moment, I basically switched from being a painter to a photographer. I was so naive about photography that I would take, if I saw something wonderful, I'd take one picture of it or two pictures. And so in the ten, nine or ten months I was there, I took about 30 rolls of film only. It was amazing. I never have, have had that uh, amount of good pictures per roll again, never again. I lived in a maid's room on the seventh floor of the building on number one, and that was my view out the window. And I used to, that window was in a gable. It wasn't easy for me to, to look out of, but I spent a lot of time sort of leaning out in a very uncomfortable position looking at that square. It was, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. And the little cafe down there, the Monaco, is where I hung out and all my friends and compatriots hung out in that place. And uh, I had a lot of wonderful experience in that. This was the center of my, my world there. Uh, I have two favorite pictures in this exhibition. One of them is next door to the Monaco, there was a tabac. And the, the walls of the tabac and the pillars were covered with little square mirrors. And I went in there and I saw people reflected in this and it, it came out Cubist. And I loved the Cubist and, and the, as I said, the uh, man I was studying with was Cubist. And I took two friends from the Monaco and said, come in and sit and I want to take some pictures. And I took two. And uh, I love that picture because it has this feeling of, of Cubism that I have no other way to get it except that way. And the other picture is the one of, uh, in Andre Lode's studio of the, the, uh, the nude model and the, the painter sitting there and they sort of make an S uh, shape with their bodies. And he, the student, who was a, a friend of mine a little bit, a Frenchman, a boy, he wanted to take a picture with a model to send back to his parents in the Provence. So I posed them and I took the picture and I took one. Those are my two sort of favorites in a, in a nostalgic way. In a way, the pictures that I took in Paris in 1955 and the pictures I'm taking in New York now in 2005 are completely different in every way from each other. The French pictures are about atmosphere and uh, ambiance and people and mood and, and that kind of color. And they're all in black and white and very grainy and, and, and textured. And the pictures of New York are, are they're 
they're of their architecture mostly. They're bridges and uh, and buildings and fountains, and they're all in a sort of distorted kind of color and, and with black skies. I call it a, the dark sky series. A totally different viewpoint, a, way, a different way of looking at things that isn't necessarily because I'm seeing things uh, in general so differently in New York, because New York is a wonderful city just like Paris. It pulp, it pulp, palpitates in the same way. But that's just the way I happen to have developed myself and, and how, how I'm seeing things and what I'm choosing to shoot here now. A new film by Claire Denis always raises the question, where will she go now? It's not just that she's as likely to film in Africa as on the Champs-Élysées, it's that she takes different directions with her scripts and elliptical style. In The Intruder, she explores the consciousness of a man with a heart transplant as he searches the South Seas for a lost son. Canapé takes a look at a French original. I read it, I really felt it was uh, important for me to understand why it was so interesting, why it was so accurate to any people who would read it and why it was opening so many doors to sensation and emotions that belongs to the to any human spirit you know and how can someone who describe his heart transplant could express it in with words that make those lines understandable for someone who, because he's in good shape or is young, has never felt even he has a heart in his chest, you know. Look, I, I have only, I have my original heart, but I would imagine if I, if I had a new heart, going through that process, as Jean-Luc Nancy says in his book, I would understand how purely mechanical it is, and also how very metaphysical it is, you know? Or spiritual, I don't know. I don't know what it is to change heart, because for many people, and of course for me, heart it's not a pump that do this kind of basic hard job in my body. It, it's uh, it's the um, of course it's not true, but for many people it's where um, it's like um, as if this muscle was instead of pumping blood. Um, to act, activate the circulation was um, the center of feelings, you know? You would say in French, and I'm sure in English, uh, I know in English too, that I feel it in my heart, you know? Which of course doesn't mean you feel it in your heart, because it's hard to feel a heart, but you it's something deep in you, like you in as if it was that that beating was also the signal of life. The end of beating is the signal of death, and because of that, heart became the center of human emotions. Mm -hmm. 